Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome back to the day two of the seminar uh, on reimagining the future of education management information system. Um, so uh, before uh, starting the session, I'd like to kindly remind all participants to keep your microphone and video off. And then uh, also uh, the speakers, when you are invited, please turn on your video. Uh, and uh, this uh, seminar is um, uh, taking place in two languages, uh, simultaneous interpretation between okay. French and English is pre provided. So if you want to uh, change the language, uh, please um, see the icon interpretation uh, on the bottom of the, the screen, and then you can choose uh, the button of the language that you would, like, you would prefer to listen to. So before uh, starting the sessions, I'd like to kindly invite uh, my colleague Satoko to introduce uh, to, uh, the, to today's session while also providing some recap of what we discussed and, uh, and uh, discussed and reflected on yesterday. Satoko Yano has uh, 20 years of experience in international education and is currently a uh, program specialist at UNESCO headquarters, leading a team uh, working on education sector planning uh, and policy, and as well as AMIS. He is involved in providing technical assistance and capacity development support in education policy review, sector plan development and monitoring, and many other areas. So prior to uh, joining UNESCO headquarters, he he worked uh, in, in he, he has taken various positions at uh, uh, several uh, offices uh, in the field, in Asia, uh, Bangkok, uh, New Delhi, as well as, uh, um, as a chi uh, Beijing, China. So uh, Satoko, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Zisi. And thank you. And then very good morning, or good afternoon, good evening, dear participants. Thank you very much for joining the day two of the International Seminar on Futures of EMIS. As Zisi said, we started it yesterday with a very, very interesting uh, session and presentations coming from various uh, backgrounds and the stakeholders. We had, uh, but you know, after listening to all, I think uh, many, a uh, few things become, uh, became very, very clear. That then first, we all agree that the data are criti critically important for us to all to make the effective and equi equitable decision making for education. As the, the Stefania Giannini, the, 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 the Assistant uh, Director General for, for Education in ESCO mentioned, planning, uh, planning without data is more like a uh, flying blind. So we need the good data to make the right decisions. At the same time, we, we all noted that the traditional emis, like how we used to imagine, how we used to think of emis, was not really suitable for us to meet the emerging data challenges that we faced during the school closures last year. You see. And with that con the context, we also noted that the countries and all development partners are very much committed to filling the, the gap. And we are all looking at the same direction. And then looking into the, uh, trying to learn from the lessons that then we had during the COVID-19 uh, education disruption. So with that, after listening to all the presentations, there are some the common needs that are emerging as a lesson learned from the COVID-19. The first, we definitely need real-time data to keep monitoring the students' learning. And we also need to have the EMIS that can support learning in increasingly becoming hybrid learning systems. We also noted that then we do need a data system that can capture processes, not only inputs and outputs, but then uh, and see actually what's happening in between. And then for that, we definitely need individual data at the students and teachers so that then we can track what is happening to them. We also noted that then we, there's a need for further integration and the interoperability of the data system that then exists or becoming to exist by leveraging the technologies. 
These are some of the key points that then we took from the presentation. We also had a very good, interesting points raised in the chat function, and also the questions that then which we are not able to address during the during the session, unfortunately due to the time constraint. There's a there's a question about how to make how to make sure that the data coverage are uh, uh, equitable, and then so that then almost marginalized are not excluded from the data system. And there is a there is a need that uh, this new MS or future MS would be sector wide. And then also could monitor the well being of students and teachers that have become very important during the, the school closure. And last but not least, there's an interesting discussion or comments being exchanged from here. What could be the scope of MEs? Should we focus on the models of the functionalities of MEs, or do we need to expand the functionalities? But there was the, the risk of overwhelming the system. So we um, had some responses from the, the, the presenters, panelists yesterday. And for instance, for the, how to make sure the data coverage is unequitable. We do think it's important that the hybrid approach to data collection, especially the offline and online and paper-based, especially in the transition, there'll be the uh, multiple approaches to data collection so that then everybody will be included. So the sector-wide coverage should also be uh, fully ensured by especially uh, having, using the uh, multiple sources of the data MA so called we, we have the usually have the school census data, but then increasingly using the household survey data, which could capture more uh, uh, more uh, uh, subsectors such as ECC and the technical vocational education that could be less uh, in the organized and formalized way. And the monitoring of being students and teachers, that's also very important that the, at the moment US does not collect. This uh, area, the information around this area, but then should be definitely possible countries to look into the possibility of start monitoring this aspect. And last not least, in agreeing on sc uh, scope of learning, it's very, very important. And that's also the topic of the second day, today's session. So today we will continue with uh, more speakers looking into the futures. Yesterday, we looked at the lessons learned from the last year, from the past, most more likely. And then today, we will be looking into the future. With all, with all presenters, we are going to start talking about what should future MS look like. And then also, what are the key capacities and approaches that we need to actually operationalize the future MS? And we will also be talking about how can future MS could leverage advanced technologies. So uh, this is what we're going to expect today, and then we really look forward to the uh, interesting further discussion today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Back to you, CC. Thank you, Satoko, for the great introduction. So I kindly invite our uh, participants to share uh, your comments, questions via the chat room. And also, uh, importantly, also uh, you kindly invite our speakers to respect the time allocated so that we uh, we can have some more interaction through the Q&A uh, sessions. So uh, from here, I'd like to switch to French. Um, so uh, let's... The next session is based on the future capacity for uh, MS. It will be moderated by Stéphane Vincent Lacra from OECD. Stéphane is a senior analyst and project leader at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Directorate for Education and Skills. He's in charge. He was in charge of work on education during the COVID crisis, but he's also in charge of OECD work for digitization in education, especially work on smart data and digital technology in education. He also leads work on disciplinary innovation and change management, especially the promotion and the management of creativity in education. More generally, he works in innovation 
through education, on research and education, on, on the way in which new trends influence the future of learning and educational policy at the level of school, uh, Stefan, you have the floor. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be invited here to moderate this session on the technical, human and financial capacities to uh, develop uh, information management systems. We have an excellent panel. with presentations that will enable me to share the experience of various countries through the crisis as well as the challenges that are coming up to develop capacities in this area. We will welcome Shiloh Nikon from South Africa. I'm not going to read the extensive biographies that you have in the program because we don't have much time, but he's Chief Information Officer at the National Department of Basic Education. Francesca Pina works at UNESCO. She works on education for migration and uh, in situations of emergency. Alpha Bar from The Gambia. He's head of the Information and Communication Technologies and Education Management Information System Units. And then Ruba Omari from Jordan, who is the director of the Queen Rania Center for Education and Information Technology at the Jordanian Ministry of Education. Each presenter will have eight minutes, so I'm going to ask you to be very strict with time so that we have a little bit of time for the general discussion. Shiloh, you have the floor. Shiloh, you are on unmuted. Go ahead now. Ah, great. So, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Um, I think uh, I want to cover some of the leverages of, of the lessons that we've learned during COVID. Uh, from a South African experience perspective. So I'm going to cover the uh, South African school landscape and the length and breadth of what we have, just some quick reflections of 2020, um, and then leveraging the systems and data on how we utilized uh, EMIS data going forward, and then how we see the future in terms of accelerated development. So what you see on your screen is a live dashboard. Um, on the top left, you'll see the total number of schools. So in South Africa, we have 25,475. And at the bottom, you can see how that is segregated. We have a total of 457,000 educators, uh, and they are responsible for educating 13 million learners. And on the right-hand side, you can see the breakdown of those learners. So upon reflection of, of what has happened, you know, from a perspective, we realize that we have very strong policies, but you know, as Satoko mentioned earlier on, we lacked real-time uh, uh, data. From a finance perspective, our operational budgets were cut, um, and to fund the um, PPEs, uh, as well as you know, some of that funding was used for stimulating our economy, um, and we had to then you know find ways of of announcing the system because obviously we rearranged the curriculum, we rearranged attendance, and all of those things have to be reflected on EMIS. Fortunately, our modernization project uh, was ring-fenced in terms of its finance, so that wasn't very impacted. From an operational perspective, you know, we had to equip our resources to make sure that they can do verification and validation at school. So bring 
the, the, the issue of mobility is there. From a data management perspective, our system has mandatory and non-mandatory. And a lot of the data that we required during this period was actually non-mandatory. And, and a lot of the data was not verified or validated, and the accuracy and completeness, you know, was 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 questioned. I think the biggest lesson that we learned is around data uh, and and bringing in the culture of data management. From a supporting systems perspective, you know, we have a very rigid system, so the time to market, time to value was was in question. Um, we had integra um, integration for automation and data verification was not there. So, you know, the data that we presented was sometimes questioned. Um, out of this, we born a, uh, a mobile solution for data collection, and I'll share that as part of the uh, additional slides that I've I'm not going to go too much into that. From a digital access perspective, you know, we realized that the basic infrastructure in terms of electricity, connectivity was not there. Um, fortunately, we have a blended approach for both the collection of offline as well as online data. So some of the highlights and the lowlights that, that led to how we want to shape our modernization. A lot of it was, you know, uh, around security, core uh, essentials to support data awareness, uh, adaptability and agility uh, and intergovernmental uh, dependencies for the supporting infrastructure. So, from an EMIS perspective, despite these challenges that we had, we then put together what is called a differentiated risk adjusted approach to the opening of schools. And this was largely using the uh, uh, Department of Health uh, data and, and, and their risk levels. And we then looked at how do we put that. Uh, into a uh, spatial dashboard that was developed and, and each school was plotted against us. We developed a risk alert strategy um, and we, you know, the returning and on the opening of schools, we successfully defended in, in our courts, including the highest court, which is the constitutional court, uh, eight times out of nine. The ninth one was about the uh, NSNP, the uh, nutrition program. And we also shared this data with other, other governmental agencies to then get a quick view of what happens in our country holistically. So this was the risk alert levels. And as you can see different grades going. So this is how we applied the risk alert level. So again, what you can see, the center is a map of South Africa, all the districts, and those gave you whether we are high risk, uh, hot spots, hot spots, emerging hot spots and vigilance, and, and then it told you which schools were impacted. So analyzing that data, we could then say that in a high risk hotspot, only grade 12s and grade sevens would return and, and, and schools of skill for year seven would return to schools. And those were then the number of schools that we could open um, both primary, secondary, combined and special schools, uh, the number of educators that could return as well as the number of uh, learners. And that's a different approach. And this data, came from the EMIS system. Um, the other one that we utilized was, was around uh, the uh, school readiness for reopening. Uh, and here we looked at a manual approach for collecting data across 14 key indicators. Uh, we, this was an extremely resource intensive uh, uh, process where we used to spend about three to four hours reporting uh, on a weekly basis. And then data was converted into a reporting and as I mentioned we developed a WhatsApp solution for, for, for easier reporting. So this is what we presented. So our uh, um, uh, uh, educational management teams now could get a quick view of what is the state of each province and the schools with regards to their readiness across those 14 factors. Uh, this is the, the dashboards that was developed for each of the provinces. So that is how we've utilized data coming from EMIS. In terms of going forward, you know, we realized that our EMIS systems and the data that has come through that was either point of collection and more on compliance. And it's very, very difficult to collect. So what we now decided to do from a modernization perspective is that the school at the operational level will be given an open EMIS solution that is, will enable the school to, 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 to transact within all of its uh, uh, administration as well as management.
Currently, we then will collect learner, teaching, management, and admin data. And that will be used at a district level to manage the districts or the schools. And then at a provincial educational department level, that will be a strategic data. And at the DBE or the national level, we're looking at added policy. So the solution we are building takes policy all the way down to implementation, brings it back up for monitoring, evaluation, and tweaking. What we're then going to do is our solution then looks at a cost system product that looks at user administration, master data management, workflow engine, and a business rules engine. The business rules engine takes all our policies and converts that into uh, uh, rules that run the system. From a core functional perspective, we're looking at document management, dashboarding and reporting, uh, case management, property and assets, task and schedule, and financial management. To get together with these two, they form the core of what we're wanting to do in terms of the what we call the business products on managing and administrating the school. Here we're looking at communication, notification, and and a large portion of this is around curriculum uh, and, and school management. You, you can peruse that and, and look at that. I think where we're heading, Stefan, is, you know, we, we, we're currently playing in the space of data and innovation. Traditionally, collecting data, reporting. Where we want to go is to start analyzing this data, you know, interpreting so that we can make informed management decisions converting that and using artificial intelligence or machine learning to really start bringing out you know, information with meaning uh, and, 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 and that can be utilized and, and conversations and storytelling around that. You know, um, I think where we want to go is start looking at really using our data to add value, you know, bringing in insightful actions. So predicting whether a learner will pass or fail or do well or not, and how we can then mold that learner into changing uh, his behavior or her behavior for better results. Thank you very much. I'm done. Uh, those are my contact details. On the presentation, there are additional si slides that can provide more uh, information. Thank you, Stefan. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Shiloh. And, and that was really an excellent presentation. And we had a lot of very interesting data and indicators that you've managed to, to, to collect. And so that's a very interesting approach. Um, so, you know, I hope we'll have time to discuss it uh, afterward. And thank you for sticking to the time. So now let's move uh, to Francesca. Francesca. Bonjour à tous. Je ne parviens pas à partager mon écran. Stop sharing yours before I can share mine. Shiloh, please. No, I can't. Uh... Can you, could you uh, stop sharing? Okay, I think it should be fine now. Good morning, everybody. So I will be hopefully doing a 10 minute presentation that really tries to um, focus on critical considerations that should guide our future efforts in enhancing MS specifically to um, support the resilience building of education systems that are facing the impacts of emergencies and protective crises. So of course, as we're here trying to um, learn from uh, what the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, demonstrated throughout the last year and a half, um, it's important to really understand that what the COVID pandemic did is really kind of bring to the global platform the challenges that are being systematically faced by education systems that are affected by emergencies and crises. In fact, like in the case of the pandemic, when an emergency strikes, um, education is among the first services that are interrupted and the last ones to be resumed. This actually unfortunately exacerbates underlying existing vulnerabilities of learners and educators that even through education, um not only do they gain, you know, technical and, uh, you know, educational skills, but also have access to essential services like protection services, health services, and nutrition services. Therefore, unless we really understand the bar, the bar sorry, the barriers, the needs, and the inequalities that may challenge the access to education for these children, we may very well increase the, the possibility of them being permanently excluded from, uh, from schooling and, of course, uh, being more marginalized uh, in, a social, in a social sphere. So 
when we do think about enhancing information systems and, in, and, and enhancing the ways we actually uh, generate and use data around education, we really need to focus on how can we better identify and address the barriers, the needs and equalities of these children, and of course, design responses that are adapted and effective in these situations. Um, and MS can be a fantastic, of course, uh, uh, source of this information if it's adapted to these purposes and can really guide all phases of emergency preparedness, response, and recovery. Uh, in 2019, UNESCO, with the support of Education Cannot Wait in ORCAP um, and CETA, we were able to do some uh, case studies in six contexts affected by crises and emergencies to really understand how MS uh, was informing education practices that were aimed to protecting learners and education workers against the effects of uh, um, emergencies and crises, uh, planning for education continuity, safeguarding education sector investments, and strengthening education system resilience through risk-informed planning. The 600 case studies also try to understand how MS was or was not being used to inform the overall humanitarian program cycle and also informing coordinated efforts um, linked to needs assessments and, of course, education planning. What we did see is that uh, the ministries of education in these six countries, they generate a huge amount of information and very often also very relevant to, to matters of education and emergencies. But there are overall challenges that are related to timeliness, quality, relevance, and availability of this information. This in some ways sparks a vicious cycle that results in duplication and fragmentation of data, weak coordination around data sharing and use, and inefficient use of resources, both human and financial. The main source of these problems that were observed were mainly linked to these three pillars that of course are extremely interrelated and must be addressed in a comprehensive manner. So the first one is of course the institutional environment, which really is about the legal policy and institutional framework, not just around uh, MS or the generation of information, but also linking it to specific institutional commitments and goals around education and emergencies and beyond. And of course, the fact that there was often um, maybe uh, a weak link between these frameworks, unfortunately resulted in weak and unsustainable capacities of, at a human, technical, and financial level for the effective use um, of these information systems. And there were also challenges related to the data production systems, specifically related to the coverage from a geographical point of view, where there were in, you know, entire maybe geographic areas that were not represented um, within these information systems, as well as specific target groups that could include groups affected by displacement, disabilities in remote geographic areas, or as well out of school children, and also with regards to scope, where education and emergency relevant indicators maybe were not included in MS, um, in MS systems. And you know, also there were challenges related to timeliness, accuracy, and perceived reliability of the information being provided by the Ministry of Education. What we also saw last but definitely not least is an overall challenge that, um, data dissemination that of course impact the effective use of the information that was being provided and, um, and could have been available. Um, this was also very much linked to challenges within the Ministry of Education among different line ministries and with humanitarian partners around the coordination for data sharing for joint assessment, planning, and monitoring. So what we understood, uh, apologies, what we understood through these case studies um, really when thinking about uh, the considerations that we must keep into account uh, for our future efforts is really that if we don't target all these three different pillars, unfortunately, we may very well risk not having um, effective interventions as, as we'd wish. And also it's important that uh, um, we can't really think about having a one-size-fits-all solution. The context specificity of the kind of interventions that we aim to implement uh, have to be context specific. They have to put coordination and sustainability at the forefront, whether we're talking about high-tech or low-tech solutions, and most of all, really have a user perspective when thinking about how we can enhance our future MS. 
Uh, now UNESCO uh, with um, also IAP and UIS and education cannot wait to mark up in CEDA. We are implementing country specific recommendations um, or actions that are linked to the recommendations that were brought forward by the case studies in Ethiopia, South Sudan and Chad. And also hoping to uh, really be guided by different promising practices that we're able to collect from different practitioners and ministries of education around the world to create these global public goods. And uh, what we have been implementing since the beginning of the year and for the next years are really actions that target the you know these four different uh, um, elements that are on this slide so the first one is really about strengthening and linking legal policy and institutional frameworks around ms and education and emergencies the second one is about building system capacity on crisis sensitive sector analysis, policy and planning to really make sure that the information systems and the commitments around information systems in some way reflect um, also the, the ultimate purpose for why we are collecting this, uh, this data and what kind of evidence we really want to build um, and where we want to go. Reviewing data collection and processing tools accompanied by training and support to, to facilitate their use and this is aim to be done all along the data chain, like uh, uh, Dr. Nyken did it said before, up to the level, down to the level of the actual school, who are the ultimate providers and the users of this data. And last but not least, strengthen the coordination around data within ministries of education, across line ministries and partners. And this of course includes also um, partners and ministries that, that are specifically working in other sectors that are very much linked to education, such as those of uh, health and nutrition, WASH, and uh, overall social welfare. So that's it. I hope it was in the 10 minutes, because I know that yesterday, everybody, <laughs> we went overboard. But uh, if you anyone asked, has any questions. Sorry? You were, as you were within the 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Actually, you, you know, three pillars, which are indeed uh, super important. I think that the, the crisis aspect is quite interesting because it very much broadens the types of indicators that we believe could be relevant. And I think that's one of the effects of, of, of the COVID crisis. So now I would like to invite uh, uh, Alphaba to take the floor. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me, my, my name is Alpha Bab from the Gambia uh, under the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this um, initiative that we are continuing since 2018 when we met in Paris on the same agenda of EMIS. And now that is very timely given the concern and the challenge we are facing. So I will do a, set, a presentation. As you can see on the first slide, slide here, you will see that we are talking about image innovation, the Gambia, Uganda, Iswati. And you will see the Gambia emblem and the logo for the other two countries. And at the bottom, you will see uh, the DHIS2 um, logo. This is very important. Some people will be wondering why would we will be also doing this presentation for other countries and, and, and partners. I think, uh, as you know, since yesterday, you may realize that the issue of data is becoming very interesting and demanding, and it's taking different dimensions. So I would say it's a, a, a saying that goes which says that when you are going too fast, go alone. But when you are going too far, you need partners. You need to go with other people. So hence, we need to partner with other colleagues, with other co countries to, to who are, who've been on the journey. And that's one of the reasons why we are taking this adventure right now. Next slide. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, the issue of data, particularly for the education sector, has been really um, facing a huge challenge, particularly when school closed. The need for up-to-date data was really a problem, even to advise what to do 
in terms of developing um, the image, uh, the, the school closure, the country level plan to make sure that you are able to have remote learning. So responding to those kind of data need was a big, big challenge. In another word, there was no more data available for planners to support um, the education response plan for COVID. And that's one of the biggest problems we, we face. And the issue of support for more online, offline is a big challenge. Uh, even if you want to go decentralized in the, in, the, in the context of electricity and connectivity and, and, and resources about mobile devices. So the issue of offline, online is a huge issue. Not, not to mention the issue of capacity for local innovations. Therefore, in, in the history, every, all the effort of image were based on support from donor partners. And if you have to question countries now to take charge and lead the process of innovation and capacity for data, you really need um, a lot of um, capacity and partners to work with you on that. And there is a need for synergy for across countries, um, particularly within countries, from one sector to another. And the issue of leveraging existing data, particularly using the Bureau of Statistics data for um, GIS data, census data, um, civil rights um, and vital statistics, the mixed data, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we've been faced. And it has we have to rely on, in a nutshell, on secondary data to advise policy for school opening, for school closing, and remote learning. Next slide. Now, in the, this call for the MSC. Before the pandemic, there had been this challenge of data, particularly for meeting the data gap for SDG4. For since 2016, the issue of data gap was prevalent. But when, when, when COVID came, it was like in many falls. You used to collect data from the education environment, but now the kind of data you are requested to collect has to come outside the education environment. You're talking about home learning. You're talking about distant learning. You're talking about support for, for, for that. So that calls for data that is looking at the learner itself. And when you look at the learner data, you have to look at the parameters around the learner including the socioeconomic data. Those are the kind of data that are new, and that will help us to measure equity and the inclusive issue, and then the, the learning challenge. Because now, as you may realize that, we have got most, almost everybody is in school, but the challenge is learning. But what metrics do you use to measure learning? What kind of indicators do you present on policy uh, uh, makers? so that we can, make an, we can make a game changer in terms of the learning challenge. So this is the kind of challenge we have right now. That's why we are shifting to the school and cluster and then going back to the head office. But when the pandemic came, even school level data is not enough. You need wider data. So this is another challenge we face. Next slide. Now, in terms of the, the data types and all the effort we are doing right now, even though you are going individual, you are going micro, you need to find a way of ensuring that this micro small level data is able to give you the aggregate data you need. At the end of the day, it's aggregate that you, you need, but you need smaller data right there. So what, what, what is more important also is what about how do the schools and the local community partners use this data at school level to ensure that it benefits them first. So in other words, aggregate data used to benefit everybody, but then we've missed the, the most important people, the most important actors, the teachers, the, the classroom teachers, the, who needs this data to use it when they need to make um, reforms at the, the school level. Next slide. Now, in terms of the e-government platform and architectures, this is very, very important. And this is why I said you need partners in the beginning. What we are trying to do in Gambia, for example, with DHIS, is to ensure that uh, we bring Minister of Health on board so that we can get the overlapping uh, SDG indicators that are, that, are, that are supported by health. And for a very long time, we've been asked to pro uh, provide some indicators, such as nutrition, social protection, and sanit uh, water sanitation, 
these are things that we have to work with other partners, other sectors. So this is why we need to have interoperability between one sector and another. And in this case, we have got already support with um, locally to work with Minister of Health because DHIS has been there before. So in another words, how do we leverage that partnership and, and move on to other sectors? Next slide. Now, in terms of real-time data, we, what is important is to build the system to have a, a repository data where everybody can go and access, and then it's comparable with other data, it's comparable with MIPS, it's comparable with GBOS data, and, and health data, for example. And, and these are the things that we really need to have built locally, using our institutional systems locally, and drive the agenda while we are having partnership. So you could see some of the examples of the dashboards that you could generate from this kind of um, data when you have it online. Thank you. Next slide. Okay. Uh, this is an example of Isuati dashboard. Another area where we are using data, DHIS output report to show how did, um, it can allow policymakers at various level to make good sense of the data. Next slide. So next slide, the innovation part. Now in the Gambia, we have an example, a very good innovation, teacher data at, uh, attendance system. That is the daily attendance. You may recall that for a very long time, we were not able to report teacher attendance and student attendance. So for, we have this problem of attendance as a gap. In another word, attendance will be presented later after three terms, after the end of the academic year. But because of this um, availability of DHIS and using smart uh, phones and SMS, using mobile operators, and we integrated with VPN, we are able to now have daily, daily attendance data. So we are able to close the gap in terms of attendance, what is happening on a daily basis. We used to happen every every year. Next slide. Now, this is another example where DHIS is used, even in the case of the Gambia, where we are our Minister of Health. In terms of our partnership, we, are, we understand that they are using vaccine and uh, DHIS for people to re get access to it in terms of um, through SMS and, and through apps. Here is an example where it's used in Rwanda, Uganda, Guinea-Bissau. So this is one of the reasons where we thought we will leverage this kind of opportunities and, and ride on this kind of silos. Next slide. Now that's another example in Sri Lanka where you are using, they're using COVID vaccine registry online and offline using existing system. So in, in a nutshell, there's already some very good um, um, experience where this is used, and the education is already going to follow on this. Similar parts. Next slide. Now, here is the last slide. This is the challenges and the way forward. Now, now that we have uh, having within the education sector, fragmentation and data, every other unit and director is collecting their own data. There is a problem of interoperability. How do you ensure we, we have one data set for, for the sector? And the cost, how do you save costs? How do you reduce redundancies? How do you make sure that it makes sense? Now, this is the problem we, we are faced. Like I said, the SDG4, we've not been able to even create all of it. So we still have a gap. Now we have a problem of uh, issues like COVID related. How do you ensure learning assessment for somebody who is using in a, a distant learning. How do you ensure that you are able to uh, treat the, the, the special needs? Those are the kind of things we need. But then the good thing is, in terms of the way forward, we want to work with partners and ensure that the local systems drive this process. That's the ecosystem. We have our local universities. We, have, we want to ensure that the university play a role. For a long time, we have left the university behind image. So whatever was done was driven by donors and, and local partners here and there. 
But the universities are old. They've been here and have been providing for every sector. How do University of the Gambia, for example, provide support for EMIS? And so that the tools that we are using, the sources from them, and so that the capacity we need for planning comes from them. And now that EMIS is going to the everywhere, up to the household, the demand for number of people that needs it is, is enormous. If you don't have a system that answers that, we have internships. Who will be coming and be acting as EMIS people? How are we going to sustain? Even when we had a smaller group, sustainability of human resources was a challenge. Now we are having emails going everywhere. If you don't involve other, other institutions, shifting from donor driven, shifting from these uh, isolated uh, incidences, we need to say that what can we do? There is some demographic dividend that's already happening, and we have very good universities around that can really uh, help. So, this is one of the things we want to do. In addition Thank to that, you, Alpha. we want to ensure that one set, all the other sectors come on board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry Thank you. For... That's very, very impressive. I mean, you can see the dashboards, and you've really pointed to very important questions, you know, the timeliness of data to make it actionable. So let's now invite uh, uh, Ruba Omari to make her presentation. And if she would like to pose some questions, please do so in the chat so that the speakers can see it and we can actually use the question time efficiently. Ruba, the floor is yours. I think you're muted because uh, of it. Sorry, yes. Hello, everyone. First of all, I, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me here today to, to represent my country and share with you our experience in activating MS in the Jordanian Ministry of Education. The topic of my presentation today will explore the technical, uh, human, and financial capacities required for an effective MS in Jordan. Ruba, perhaps you can put your camera yes. on. Yes. If you... Okay. I will start with the uh, timeline, implementation timeline. Our uh, current formal system, Open MS, was first supported in Jordan in 2014 through European Union funding and UNESCO technical support. We start with the phase one. And in 2016, Open MS officially launched after customizing and testing. But by the end of uh, 2017, Open MS is fully customized and operational as per phase one of our requirements with capacity development approach. Also, Open MS in uh, this stage linkage with uh, civil status and passports departments. Between 2018 and 2019, a comprehensive assessment of the system was conducted using super MS assessment methodology based on four policy areas, the enabling environments, the system soundness, quality of data, utilize, utilization of data for informed decision making. The outcomes comes of this assessment led to the uh, uh, consolidation of a clear MS roadmap. This roadmap was reflected onto a, con uh, a concrete MS operational plan for Jordan's MOE for 2020 and 2022. The plan represents the phase two of open MS. The main key elements of enabling MS environment in Jordan are MS capacities, uh, a Ministry of Education, organizational structure, human resources, MS budget, and legal framework, framework, data-driven culture, and instructional capacity. Okay. Element one, which is the MS capacities. Effective capacities in MS is a priority area to establish effective mechanisms and strategies to promote the development of the, uh, the system. The types of MS capacities required in Jordan are as following. 
the first is the operational capacity, uh, mostly in the uh, school and field directorate level, the technical capacity, mostly at the uh, central level, and the management capacity at the central level. We classified these uh, capacities into three uh, levels, strong, medium, or need more strengthening. The uh, capacity in flank are the, uh, strong, the strong capacities, while the capacity in blue and red are the capacities with need further capacity development and improvement. Element two, which is the uh, Ministry of Education, organizational structure and process. In designing MS, it is important to consider the rules of all the groups that will rely on the information at all levels. So our actions for these elements are, the Queen Rania Center uh, structure has been reform reformulated. A robust uh, coordination mechanism was established at the uh, Ministry of Education, and the MS policy enforced the necessary distinction between the different MS functions at the Ministry of Education. Element three, which is the human uh, resources. When addressing a human resources issue, it's important to manage for managers to understand how employment activities impact on the performance of the MS, including the development of job descriptions and uh, incentives uh, packages. Uh, professionals working working in the units of open MS need to understand their job functions and how they fit into the data protection uh, cycle. Uh, one of the most our uh, actions are uh, TORs for the uh, Ministry of Education MS profiles are being revised to match the MSHR requirements. Operational manual was developed to, to help cl clarify all the MS responsibilities. Uh, the need uh, to define and modify uh, for allocated in incentive for stuff with specialized technique tasks. Element four, which is uh, the budget, MOE, MS budget, it's important to have a suitable comprehensive budget in order to ensure con uh, continuity of operations, system sustainability and efficiency. Therefore, the MS policy, our MS policy defines and enforces the main budget line for uh, MS. Uh, for software and hand, hardware uh, SLA support agreements, software and hardware uh, resourcements can be replacement by cloud hosting fees and so on. Element five, which is the legal framework, having clear policy and legal framework will support the sustainability of the system. Uh, MS policy is under development at the final stage. The MOE, the Minister of Education, will develop an action plan to operationalize the policy. Element six, which is the infrastructural capacity. MS must have a well-defined infrastructure that enable it to perform its data collection, management, and other functions in an integral manner. We started with a basic data center at the National Informational Communication Technology Center. This center uh, has been upgraded, and now we have uh, cloud hosting options uh, for the Open MS. It's under analysis. The cost benefits analysis is conducted. Uh, also, we a uh, computer network has been built to connect all our schools and education directorates to the ministry center and to provide internet service to them. Element seven, which is the data-driven decision-making culture. The main goal is to enable all employees and decision makers to use data effectively effectively to enhance their daily work by making more successful uh, decisions. In this field, our actions were, uh, are, uh, are the following that dashboards were developed using often MS tools. We have a mini dashboard, MS mini dashboard, uh, education uh, strategy plan domain, specific dashboards for them, and 73 RFK KPIs, educational KPIs uh, dashboards. Thank you, Rebecca. Can you wrap up? 
uh, finally, as reported in uh, this offense working paper, the pandemic was a woke up call to existing calls that make many MS uh, unprepared to the uh, to continuously inform effective education management and support uh, learning even in the uh, event of an emergency or crisis for us this required a great and uh, continuous effort day and night to bridge this gap in order to be able to deploy distance learning program uh, quickly i will talk about the top priority uh, for the next uh, uh, next phase uh, first, enhance the Ministry of Education technological and infrastructural capacity. In this field, the first version of Jordan's open MS mobile application has been developed. Also, GIS is being further enhanced, accommodated a hybrid mobile with the smart school maintenance module. The MOE has developed a, a cost benefit analysis for different cloud hosting. Priority two, full integration between open MS and the learning management system adopted by the MOE. Uh, now the APIs are being developed through a capacity building approach to allow integration with other uh, systems. Finally, the, uh, the priority number three, improve the MS system soundness and data quality, reliability. Uh, open MS data quality has uh, proven uh, to be fairly accurate upon using it to feed the learning that uh, learning management uh, system platform uh, and data gaps still exist and therefore the ms data quality monitoring tool are planned to be developed uh, prior, the next priority, improve open MS static and dynamic reporting modules. We have static uh, reports and uh, we, uh, the operational plan has planned and ongoing activities to improve the existing static reportings and to develop a dynamic reporting module. Uh, finally, strengthen technical and operational MS capacities time management skills and uh, the ability to work in crisis sensitive situation. Uh, the operational plan that is being implemented based on a solid and well-defined capacity development approach included associated, associated roles and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rubab. You highlighted very well, actually, the different components and the complexity of uh, the uh, ME system and, and, and strategy to make it usable. So perhaps we have just time for one question. Uh, and, you know, we had a few remarks in the chat on, you know, the importance of use cases and some practical uh, uh, considerations. There was one question for um, about the, the connection of rural schools uh, to, to the system. And I think that was a question for Alpha, but perhaps Francesca can talk also about that if you want to respond, but very briefly, because we're already behind schedule. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear you. It was about the access to rural, uh, from rural schools, you know, to, to the system. Yeah, actually, uh, what we are doing right now is trying to track them individually, which means you have to go and meet them wherever they are. You don't necessarily have to meet them, particularly for these special needs, you have to really um, try to reach them and target them. Uh, individually. So that's the advantage okay. of getting them now. Okay, thank you. And Francesca, and do you have in that in, in the countries where you work? But what I can say is that uh, the approaches that we're trying, I mean, the observations that uh, that we that we got from the case studies was really about this context specificity in the sense that in some places there has to be um, there has to be solutions that mix high tech with low tech solutions that really allow to access uh, the most uh, hard to reach areas and to really gather the necessary information without, of course, not overburdening. Um, I saw that there was another question on the, in the chat about having these very like top down approaches mm -hmm. without necessarily being considered about the challenges uh, um, that are faced by school directors and, and headmasters in actually uh, compiling all these questionnaires that may be burdensome. So, so yeah, whether it's about accessing and whether it's about really being mindful of actual challenges of gathering too much data that may not necessarily be as relevant or useful for planning purposes, that it is definitely something that that has guided our reflection in the approaches that we are that we are uh, that we are putting in place. Thank you. And Shiloh, do you have a comment on that? 
Thank you, Chair. So I, I think a couple of things. One is that, you know, in South Africa, what we're doing is we are allowing our users to drive the design of the system, you know, and, and that's across uh, all nine of our uh, uh, provincial education departments and across all quintiles of schools. So even rural schools, what we are doing is that we are building an offline solution for them to conduct their activities and allowing a system that enables them to do their work. So it's not about collecting data. It's about giving you a tool to, 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 to help you with your administration and management. And inherently that data gets collected, you know? Um, and, and it's always a difficult one because your rural schools are generally are much smaller schools. They don't offer uh, as much uh, 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 services as your uh, sort of urban and, and, and semi-rural areas. In South Africa, we also got um, combined schools, you know, which makes it difficult to go in with a singular solution. So you've got to be very, very flexible in that. But, um, you know, I, I agree with Francesca, you know, you, whatever you do, you have to have a meaningful impact in what you want to achieve from that. And it's got to be fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you. And Rudolf, do you face this kind of uh, access challenge as well? Okay. So... Sorry, a second, uh, did you... No, I, was, I was calling on Ruba if, if she wanted to make a comment on that as well. But okay, let's let's wrap up this session. So thank you so much to our four panelists for wonderful presentations. Uh, you know, I think that one of the, some of the takeaways for me is the importance actually of the usability, so the timeliness and the quality of the data to make them useful to different stakeholders. Of course, the difficulty of the interoperability and the possible fragmentation of all the systems, but a lot of good developments already in the field. The I would say one of the lessons of the crisis is really the importance of widening uh, the type of indicators that are collected, but also, of course, you know, a better understanding of facing some of the challenges on the ground, you know, and so there was a kind of a common thread around mobile, offline, online, and, and, and you know, some of the difficulties. So thank you so much uh, to all of you for a great session. And uh, <laughs> The floor is back to the, for the next session. Thank you very much. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Stéphane, uh, for uh, cette... Uh... Thank you very much, Stéphane, for this very efficient uh, moderation. Thank you. Now coming to the next uh, session, I'd like to, before that, invite the speakers to take a look at the chat room because there are questions that are asked and if these speakers can answer directly uh, using that space, the chat space. So let's move on to session three of our seminar, which is on uh, Frontier Technologies to Leverage uh, for the Future, EMIS, uh, which will be uh, moderated by Mr. Bun Shakrun. He is uh, at the head of lifelong learning uh, division in UNESCO, and his work uh, is on the world trends uh, uh, for the development of competence in the context of the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, uh, looking at systems of competence, and has written many articles on the development of uh, competence and uh, on lifelong learning. So, Borin, you are now going to be moderating this important session three. Thank you very much. We've uh, gained a little bit of time. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to all colleagues and to uh, warm welcome to all the participants and also to uh, the speakers in this session. The session is about uh, the impact and uh, the implications of the frontier technologies on education management information systems. In the session, we will hear, first of all, what do we mean by frontier technologies? We hear about uh, artificial intelligence, data analytics, cloud computing, Internet of Things, 5G, name it. 
And it would be important that we understand uh, when we are speaking about frontier technologies, what are we speaking about? Would be also uh, understanding how uh, education management and information system are or will be uh, shaped by those frontier technologies. Are they uh, responding uh, to a demand or are they uh, supply driven in their approach? How frontier technology can be implemented in rich resources settings or in low resources setting? We are hearing from different examples of countries and can countries leapfrog? What will be the barriers? Are frontier technologies disrupting or modernizing? What does it mean in terms of the implementation? So those are questions that we would like to discuss today and, and to uh, engage in this discussion. We have uh, an important panel of uh, speakers uh, who uh, will be sharing their perspective, their experience from uh, government officials to a corporate perspective to a global and international uh, organization perspective. And uh, we'll be hearing uh, from uh, Mr. Avi Sharabi, uh, who is the uh, technology executive at KPMG with more than 25 years of experience in the development and delivery of large scale business transformation in Australia and US. He's also a uh, lead at KPMG digital um, uh, Delta team for the financial service sector. We'll then hear from uh, Mr. Daishan. Uh, we uh, already uh, met with uh, Mr. Deshan yesterday. He's the senior vice president of Wedom Cloud Education Group, chairman of Demos Group, and president of Breast Business School. We'll have the pleasure to hear from Mr. Ali Al Yafi, who is currently the advisor to the Minister of Education at the United Arab Emirates, and uh, he has uh, more than 25 years of experience in information technology and digital transformation in public sector and private sector as well. We'll have a pleasure to have intervention from uh, my colleague and, and friend, the Stéphane Vincent Lancrin, who uh, is a senior analyst and project leader at the, at the OECD, and uh, who is leading important work on uh, leveraging frontier technologies in education and training. Last but not least, uh, an, an important member of the uh, Global Education Coalition uh, Microsoft, and we will hear from uh, Louis Mackey, who is the MS Cloud Business Development Lead for Microsoft Education, Middle East and North Africa since 2019, and he's supporting the capacity of education system on modern MS. That's the menu of the day, and uh, we'll be very uh, keen to hear from our colleagues. Uh, I would be a bit uh, sharp in, in the timing, so uh, I will give you uh, notes when uh, we are getting close to the end of the seven minutes. Most of you have a long uh, presentation, so I will call uh, on your uh, diligence and, and your kindness to uh, stick to the timing so that we have a discussion with the participant as well. Avi, I know it's very late now in Australia, but we would like to hear from you uh, regarding uh, what's, what you are doing through KPMG, what's your perspective on uh, management information system, what we can learn from corporate um, development as well. Over to you, Avi. Uh, good afternoon, Baran. I've just started my, uh, my stopwatch, so I'm going to try and finish mine in seven minutes. So, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your time uh, this afternoon, for inviting me, for sharing one of, some of my perspectives. With you. As you said, my name is Avi Shirabi and I'm a KPMG partner specializing in data. I've been asking to speak to you today about the evolution of MIS technology and its specific impact on the future of technology. And there's really three things that I want to highlight for you today. Is, um, some of the general evolutions of MIS technology, some of the examples that we see from the public and the private sector, some of it which I've personally been involved with, and some of the work that we've been doing in the technology sector within education that help uh, progress um, education in general. Um, so it's not, this is not going to be a major surprise to all of you, but global and social development, specifically the global economy, coupled with the rapid evolution in technology, created a plethora of technology innovation, which continue to impact every facet of our daily life. We produce every day about a nine gigabytes of new information and the human interaction through social media and other channel created a vast repository of information never seen, never available before. 
We have an ever-growing set of uh, big data that coupled with progressions in quantum computing has enabled us to process, analyze data, develop simulation, predict future events, and utilize AI and machine learning technologies. Mobile devices and applications ensure that we can be connected anytime, anywhere. Access to data through IoT devices enable us to measure things such as air quality, yield from corpse, and people movement. And last but not least, RPA, or robotic process automation, ensure that some of our business processes are faster and later and less error prone. I'm just going to move through these two sections fairly quickly because the one that I want to discuss with you is really the impact on the on the education system. But just as I mentioned in my last slide, um, evolution technology has penetrated, penetrated every aspect of our life. I wanted to share with you a couple of examples of technology across multiple industry. Security circles, we all know that big data and advanced analytics have enabled us to improve an early detection of risks event, fraud, terrorism, and enable us to rapidly respond in a timely manner. Specifically in the health sector in Australia, we've managed to collect a lot of information around a patient digital patient records, which enable collaboration through the multiple departments of health services, introduction of chatbot and telehealth, provisions medical advice to people that are living in remote community, reducing the needs to lengthy and at times very complicated travel arrangement. I've been specifically involved for quite a few years in the financial services industry, where access to a large customer behavior data sets allows banks to reduce risks, have an early and improved view of vulnerable customer, and then enabling us to tailor interaction with customers that are addressing their specific needs. At KPMG, we have used access to IoT devices to ingest information related to people movement and access to lift and health and operation while we're dealing with construction and commercial uh, website. We've managed to generate multiple insights related to predictive asset management, such as air conditioning units and, and lighting and the use of lift. Um, we've also used AI and uh, to quantify traffic in the Sydney train systems, where there's different traffic through the days across uh, multiple stations, and which is then uh, fed into a workforce planning. Short move to utilizing technology to accelerate progression in the education system, but not before we're dealing with a couple of challenges that we see today through the work that we're doing through the education system. So there are about five that I want to call out. It's very, uh, the most, um, Basic one is that there are a lot of manual processes through the student administration systems. We see a fragmented customer experience where people from either the schools, carers, parents, having a very uh, different interactions. We think that there's an overburden on the, parent, on the teachers from an administrative requirements. There is an inconsistent and, and lack of equality between the different schools. There is the haves and the haves not schools, and it's according to their own sets of uh, leverages of what they have. Um, lastly, but not uh, least, is the access to disparate system that are not really help uh, used. So the way we see the ecosystem of education played is in four different segments. It's the student, the teaching experience, and the learning experience the actual learning environment, the schools of the futures, and the center, which will be the department of the future. And we see six main enablers. We, the enable number one is the connected system, integrated environment where the data flows seamlessly from one system to another, access to external information, so getting to know your student and their life context. And I think we've mentioned before, um, dealing with vulnerable students where you can get some external data from other agencies or through social media to understand uh, why student uh, attendance is uh, lacking or why students are not be able to progress in, in uh, the manners which you would expect them to. Digital capabilities, so the delivery of information and the ability of teachers, students or the community to consume that information. Obviously, ensuring the protections of all stakeholder rights to privacy, 
ensure that the data that we're dealing with is of high quality and it's fit for purpose. Last but not least, is really understanding the community to which we're engaging in. Engaging the community in a bi-directional way that allowing them to impact some on the learning process, contribute and understanding the progressions of the students. So the One last one that I want to leave you with, um, I think I've got about another minute or a minute and a half. COVID has created uh, a sense of uh, urgency where a forced academic institution to adopt and accelerate digital disruption faster than originally anticipated. The disruption has an aspect of all aspect of the system. So if we're just looking at some of the systems, specifically on the teacher and learning experience, we wanna ensure that the students have a personalized and tailored learning experience, that the parents and the care are interacting with the schools, having a better understanding through the improved MIS system and manage to actually engage with the teacher early on in the process rather than when the problems are occur. Some of the information we think needs to be uh, occurring in real time and the information availability needs to happen in real time as well. Um, in terms of the learning environment, we think that the information should be shared across multiple systems, and that's why we want this to be a connected enterprise, allowing the funding and utilization and sharing of additional curriculum content to be straightforward and enabling teachers to tailor the learning experience upon access to other schools' approaches and methods. Schools of the system, we actually think that the school of the system should become a marketplace to end up uh, with multiple services offering that align the community to engage and maybe pick and choose part of the curriculums that are more applicable to them. Principal and mentors should spend more time coaching, monitoring teachers rather than shaping schools' outcomes. Schools would make unutilized spaces available to community, activity outside school hours, and connectivity spaces allow students to stay connected. Last but not least, the department should have a very school-centric service cultures. The idea is almost to creating a marketplace of services where schools can engage with the department on services that they think are more appropriate to their demographic uh, area. Last but not least, the, the uh, department is going to assess progression across multiple schools using data sets across all the schools that it's under then jurisdictions to help with the global evolutions as well and able to improve the curriculum and their learning experience consistently across all schools. So I think I'm out of time Thank and you, um, I'm open to any question. Thank you, Avi. We'll have, uh, I hope, time for uh, engaging with the questions. Uh, let me give the floor now to uh, Mr. Deshen from uh, Weidong uh, Cloud uh, Group. Uh, Deshen, you, you have uh, seven minutes. I hope you can stick to the seven minutes. I, I think some of the elements you, you have presented yesterday, but uh, more. I hope also if you can put the full screen. I've seen comments from colleagues who, who uh, have seen that uh, the, the font was a bit uh, small. So I hope we can have the full screen uh, as well. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Very happy to be here again with you from uh, today. So we discussed about um, uh, AI data analyzed uh, and for EMC system. So is, is yesterday, uh, we want to show you very concretely some example and some exercises in vocational training area, how we can use uh, data. Why we uh, pick up this subject? We don't group from uh, three years with uh, demos and with uh, breast cancer school. We have decided to orient our business focus in vocational training because we believe that vocational training could efficiently accelerate transformation from learners to workforce uh, with the skills. We think this is a good stage for countries and regions to develop their economic and social system. So that's why we put all our energy in this area. And now, in vocational training, is not very simple uh, industry. So we need also data, we need also technology to help this uh, massively uh, training uh, needs in the world. It's a very comprehensive system. So we uh, already tested in China, in Europe, and also in Africa. In this case, uh, with this map, you say for some uh, specific jobs, for some specific business industry, we can collect needs from enterprises 
we, of course, with a very smart conception of uh, our uh, contents, our courses, and to train the people for, to help them to get new skills and new competencies. And after that, with a very uh, quick and a smart evaluation system, we can show their, uh, what was they acquired during the training. This is very important to match all information with uh, other platforms. Very important, when we collect may match information from learning processes, after that, we can also provide customized, analyzed model to our customers because each country, the, the situation is quite different. And from one job to another, the analysis systems could be very different. And after that, we can provide also some very deep analysis of all these data to improve again training system and the training courses. So an example, I would uh, put more details than yesterday about our project in Côte d'Ivoire in Africa. Again, this project consists of two parts. The first one is quite simple, is to build up a certain uh, training center for in uh, different regions. And we provide, of course, training centers, we provide the factors, and also we provide online and offline uh, commercial carry. And after that, the most important is how we can measure the efficacy of the training process and how we can also coordinate us to help political leaders to understand the result of all this training process and the training investment and how they can, again, make a better decision after that. So as you see uh, on this, uh, this is picture, we normally, in lots of uh, projects, we see just one part of the complex, very complex system because lots of trainers, they don't know what they would like to learn, and lots of enterprises, they don't know very well what skills and what competencies their new workers should have. So our job is also to through omitted conventions to perform comprehensive analysis in order to improve the operation, maximize the return on investment, and stress the industry of the uh, handcrafts is the main uh, customer of this uh, project. We have uh, three areas to collect data. First one, of course, for from training, uh, from, from training processes and from training courses. So we organize and we organize lots of training, again, online and offline training, face-to-face -face and also distance learning. And in this case, we can really collect the data of our trainees and also of our trainers uh, to know what could be the best way to transfer to 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 to, to for, for our own knowledge and also skills uh, transformation, and the first uh, seven one uh, by our online our offline uh, gallery uh, to know what could be the best product to product and to sell, because again after all vocational trainings, all these new or young workers they would like to make their success in their business. And the last not least is to help Bodiva setting up a data, a data center, national data center, to collect, of course, uh, from uh, jobs information and also to collect about industry information. After that, they can identify very precisely skills needs for each industry and for each job. And also, they can also issue the, the customer ID uh, cards to have a better follow up of all these uh, trainees and all these uh, young workers. Sorry, so two minutes to go. Okay, thank you. So, in this case, you can see also the rule very important will play by uh, National Chamber of Trades. Because when we think about vocational training, when we think about data, learning data is not just stop for learning area. We should need also to think about after, after learning the jobs efficiency and also the trade efficiency. So that's why this is a good example for EMIS, uh, what the subject of our uh, conference of today is a national uh, system combined by local system, by industry system, by commercial system. And after that, we centralize every data and we can make very comprehensive analysis and we help uh, even goes the government to set up their own analysis system and also their own data model. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I think uh, it's very important, uh, uh, Mr. Deshan, your presentation, because it, it, give, it brings another perspective related to vocational training, the link with the labor market, the lifelong learning perspective, and how uh, education management information system can be articulated with the labor market information system. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now give the floor to Mr. Uh, Ali Aliafi uh, from uh, the Ministry of Education, United Arab Emirates. Good afternoon to you, sir. The floor is yours. Please uh, stick to the seven minutes as well. Thank you. We cannot hear you, sir. OK, can you hear me now? Yes, very well, please. OK, yeah, let me maximize my screen. OK, uh, first, I'd like to thank UNESCO for setting up such an important um, session. And I would like to uh, humbly uh, introduce uh, the full UAE ecosystem for the education and how did we go about building it. So basically, we started this vision around 2016. We thought, how can we build a comprehensive ecosystem that allows capturing all activities of teaching and learning and managing education? So we designed a system that can give us the availability of data, regardless of the source of data, where it comes from, from which system, seemingly. We wanted to make sure that it is usable and the extensive function cover all the functions that are needed for the whole education spectrum. Also provides a 360 degree data model for the different aspects of learning and teaching and managing education. In addition, we wanted to make sure that it can incorporate the latest technology technology as they come on board. So what we did, as you see on your left, we designed different views. The core of the ecosystem starts from looking at the pedagogical view, all the different type of pedagogies, learning pedagogies, including the new one that came with COVID, the distance learning. Also, it has a, around it the user view, whether it's a teacher or a student or a, pet, uh, or a parent or a ministry or the different activities and functions that are needed to capture in this ecosystem, whether it's to manage education, to control it, to plan, to optimize, to do studies and research, to, for teaching and learning. And on top of that layer, we made sure that we select components that can service all the different views that are from the uh, core um, pedagogical view to the user view. The core building blocks for the systems are seven components. So we have your traditional, uh, I would call it EMIS, which is the student um, management system with the school operations and the teacher operation and the grade book, your traditional EMIS. In addition to that, an abundant sources of learning content and also to provide platform and tools to allow analytics and machine learning and advanced predictive models. In addition to that, we made sure that we include with the specialized verticals of learning solutions, such as Alex, uh, Aleph, uh, Century, Magrohill. Also, we included the e-assessment as a core component of the ecosystem. Also, the authoring of content and the curriculum management, including the mapping of learning outcomes to the remaining activities of the whole ecosystem. So we, early to that, we had foundations that we were able to build. As you know all, the UAE has started since 2012 through the Smart Learning Program, Mohammed bin Rashid Smart Learning Program. So we already established the school infrastructure by providing the network, the smart classroom, the devices, the connectivity, also the core SIS systems and the core learning system. So that was done. So around 2018, I would say, we started phase one of tighter integration between the platform, where we have integrated information done from the multiple system. So we, the, the user of the system, the collection of the data is done seamlessly and it has a single point of truth. This includes the attendance, the timetable, the grades, the behavior, the events, the surveys. 
And then at phase two, what we did, we said, okay, we see that the industry is going ahead and there are many good partners out there that develop mature advanced learning systems. So we wanted to build a container that allows to plug in these systems without limitation. You cannot just assume you can build one system that have everything. You have to make sure that it is interoperable with other learning systems that emerges and they come and they get improved. The private sectors and the ed tech sector is going quite fast. If you don't have that container concept, then you'll not be able to really extend the offering of your ecosystem. So at phase three, we took this container and we went further to make sure every single data, every single breath by any stakeholder of the system, whether it's a student, a teacher, it captures this data and captures these events. It goes to the learning record stores, the question banks, and it has a unified data model that uh, decides where are and who is the custodian of the data and a unified data that can traverse and moves across the whole ecosystem. For the future, we're looking at taking this further by enhancing AI even more. We already have AI implementation in certain verticals, but what we want to do is to use AI in two folds. One, to read the data that has been capturing, convert that into applications and functionality that can enhance the ecosystem. The other fold is to make sure that it provides these insightful machine learning, predictive, uh, uh, prescriptive type of uh, analysis. So this is more look, uh, of the look of the learning spaces. So on the left, you see the learning space that's related to school operation by our manual system, the management of the classes, the teachers, the uh, extracurricular activities. And then on the extreme right, you see we have a layer of standardized technologies of integrating any uh, educational learning management system that enhances the ecosystem capability through a standard. And these standards are derived from the industry standard, mainly the MIS Global International. And at the center of it, there is this learning portal that puts everything together. And we are fully embedded and integrated with Microsoft Office 360 that allows the, the interactivity, that allows the video conferencing and using all the 360 resources. And and also at the bottom, you see the learning curve, which provide the space for teacher and staff professional development. This is the, the high level architecture of the system. In addition to the ecosystem, we realize that it is very important to integrate with external resources of the system because some of the important data that tells you a lot about the student come from outside, either by the uh, Ministry of Interior or, or Ministry of Health or the, the Department of Human Resources. And also it, uh, it provides a, a layer that allows any uh, integration with different systems with a different level of maturity because some systems, some uh, institutions don't have the advanced system. They can only integrate with you by providing raw data, Excel files. So we need to make sure that we have a layer that can accommodate the different type of maturity of the different clients and different partners that we work with. And the most important component, as I said, is our learning resource store. This is where every single activity event through all the ecosystem is recorded. Whether it's important or not important, it doesn't matter, it records it. Then we have the analytics that goes and look at that data and tries to uh, 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 perform certain algorithms, machine learning, to give us some patterns and insights to what's happening to education. In addition to tracking standardized KPIs and indicators that are useful for improving education. This is just a quick slide I won't go through that shows the different technologies we've been using to achieve this. Our next goal is to add more of AI, AR, VR, IoT, and micro functions in this ecosystem. So we can provide more adaptive content. We can provide more benefit to the, uh, to the learner where we can respect their prior knowledge. We can see the differentiating in learning and differentiating ability, abilities so we can do pers more of personalized learning. The benefits of teachers by providing them extended use of third party tools, but yet these tools are fully integrated with the ecosystem, provides them the benefit of the tool while still making sure that we don't lose data because it's in an external system. Uh, and also to provide benefits to the institutions and the school management and 
the adaptive uh, assessment that can have the dynamic assessment depending on the capability and ability of the learner. One minute, so by, sir. Yeah, I'm almost uh, done. So basically, the strength that we have achieved by build, having this system, and this system has worked uh, successfully during the COVID uh, era, we have, now have a unified student records. We have a complete student e-learning profile. We have personalized learning. We are of capability to, to have virtual schools. Uh, we can embed with future technologies extended user experience, optimal use of the resources that we have, ability to integrate with any education learning systems that, that follows the standard, and support advanced analytics and machine learning. Definitely, to do this, you need to have strategic partners who are willing to go with you for multiple years. So we have partners there with me in this um, uh, session. You can even address them and ask them any questions if you have. And I would thank you again very much for allowing us to take uh, this opportunity to share with you what we have. We would like to offer this to other countries, other nations, and we are looking at deploying it in an online, offline, cloud, and uh, native uh, models. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you, it. Dr. Ali. Uh, it's very clear uh, presentation. And uh, of course, we take the proposal to cooperate and, and to share the experience. Uh, that's what we want to do, and that's what uh, is uh, expected as well. I think that the point, uh, at least the two points that I would like to uh, to take forward is the uh, the ecosystem perspective and how uh, you integrated all the different building blocks of the uh, management information system with learning management ma management information uh, uh, system and, and other pieces uh, that are uh, deciding on the quality and inclusiveness of the education and also the partnership they mentioned that you mentioned uh, at the end. Uh, I think we'll, be, we'll come to the discussion on the challenges uh, for sure. Uh, let me give the floor for now to um, uh, Stefan to share with us uh, a, a broader perspective, maybe a global perspective regarding uh, the next generation of uh, education management information system. Back to the future, Stefan, please. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and Thank you for the invitation. Actually, I'm going to build with really what was j just said and, and present what, like why we or a few of the things that you know we can do with new types of uh, information systems and. Uh, first thing is a very important one is that uh, you know the new generation is really longitudinal information system so that you know they really create a data infrastructure for countries to make the uh, all the data actionable and really the link into level data over time and trace you know, the, all the career of uh, each student and it's very Stephen, sorry we lose you a bit maybe uh, the mic if you can get closer sorry for that please yeah let me try to... I think that's good now. Please, that's sorry. Now. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, this next generation basically, you know, um, includes some more of the visualization and learning analytics tool, uh, provide recommendation, diagnosis tool, and, and, you know, bulk of resources. So it's very much related to what was just presented from, from UAE. A few years back, we actually did a survey of what was available in OECD countries. And, you know, the traditional information systems are really around schools, but inclusive, you know, increasingly we have these uh, longitudinal student identifiers, a bit less for, uh, you know, the, what's going on for the teachers. And in many cases, we don't have much of the student teacher links yet, which actually would also allow to make so much more uh, uh, important predictions. But what I want to say that, you know, we need to think of these systems as, you know, four different categories of systems. One, and actually, even when they are really, you know, uh, well-developed, fine-grained, etc., one is actually to use them in the original way, you know, to report and to research, you know, and that's really the system that are typically uh, designed for statistics in many ways, you know, and we have a few examples of excellent systems like that in Canada or Mexico, as, as you can see. And here the idea is really to actually inform the many the policymakers and the public and to make this information uh, actionable to them. The second time, which is interesting, is those coming from e government uh, uh, um, services in some ways, uh, because here actually the idea that you have all this information because you want to 
countries want to deliver specific services to their citizens and they need this kind of uh, system. In many of these cases, we have great linkages. So that's the case in Estonia, where you really have an excellent uh, system that links to all actually the databases in the country. In the case of Korea, we have this information that allows to, you know, allows you to apply directly to university, um, allows your folders to go from one school to the other without you doing anything. And so and they have really fine-grained information. But interestingly, in those cases, this information is usually not really used to give feedback directly to the students, the parents, uh, et cetera. Third type is you know, the school improvement data systems, and they are really made actually to give information about schools. You know, they go at the individual level, but the idea is that they're going to give schools you know, performance benchmarks to allow them to improve. That's typically the type of system and information that goes uh, you know, that the inspectorates use when they go to, you know, do their uh, uh, inspections, you know, and they want to, to uh, recommend ways to schools to improve. That's the kind of system that provides a lot of information also to the school themselves to have their own improvement routines, you know, like the data teams, the inquiry teams, uh, uh, etc. But that they're limited to that. And then we have a fourth type, which is actually much more related to what you know the UAE has presented to us just before, which I would call the expert data systems, which do some of the things that are done, but also try actually to include a lot of learning analytics at the individual level and try to make connections to links of resources, uh, etc. One example is Colorado, uh, that has one, but you know we have a few. And here you can see how they have actually a gross model. They do the school performance as in the previous type of system, but they also have connections to uh, make teachers connect to each other. They have a connection to bank of resources based on the information that uh, the schools have uh, in, their, in their classes. And so here you can actually follow the predictive models or how, you know, where the students were, where they were, they would be supposed to be given where they were before, you know, so, and, and this gives a lot of information to teachers individually about one specific uh, uh, student. So that's really a new way and all, you know, and we can have more and more good predictive models based on, on AI and, and, and advanced technology when we do that. So that's really an important aspect. And we'd like to highlight two aspects which are very important for policy making as well. And the one is actually from the US and it's actually using information about uh, US students enrolling in country colleges. So here you can see on this, on this graph, what is the kind of normal model of uh, attending a community college in the United States. So that in US here, you're supposed to be, if you're a full-time student, you do full-time, Full time, and then you can do part time over the summer, and then you start again. And so that's basically, you know, the usual way of thinking about what it is to study uh, in a community college uh, in, in the US. Then, thanks to this data information that we didn't have before, you know, researchers uh, were able to follow students over time and, um, you know, see here what it means to be, you know, part-time or full-time students. So here that's the yellow, you know, if you're full-time and if you're part-time, you're, you're blue. And so you can see how people are switching from one term to the other. And that in fact, when you arrive already at term number five, you know, the two look very much the same. And so that this very idea of having part-time and full-time students in practice doesn't exist, you know? And so what this led to is to rethink the way that community college were organized uh, um, because in fact, you know, uh, one way to fix the graduation problem that they have, you know, which is sometimes less than 10% in many cases, they had to actually review the model of what it means in practice to study in a community college. So that's, I think, a very important point because that leads to a different type of policy design. Second aspect, which actually, draws entirely on those type of data is the emergence of early warning systems that now are becoming more and more common in many countries and where basically you know the idea is how to prevent dropout from high school and here again 
you know, you have a predictor that will tell you, you know, uh, that will not only tell you who is at risk of dropping out, but which will also identify new patterns. And here, for example, we have a study showing that the type of student that we believe are going to drop out, so those who don't like school, have low and declining grades, uh, de facto, they are the ones also uh, dropping out, but only 38% of them do so, which means that 60% of students dropping out follow a different pattern. And so all of the other ones, they like school. And you know, and you even have 9% uh, students who actually have high grades uh, uh, um, and, and love school, but they still drop out. And of course, the intervention that you have to put in place for these different categories of students that you couldn't identify easily before will be different. And so here again, that's really the, the strengths of all this uh, information system for intervention and improvement of the system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, as usual, very interesting. And I think uh, uh, what is important is uh, uh, this more uh, demand-driven approach that you highlighted uh, at the end of the presentation is what are the issues that uh, predictive um, uh, analytics or other tools can help us to address. And in the last case about uh, dropout is, of course, one of the phenomena that many education systems are suffering, including OECD countries and, and, and beyond. Um, thank you, Stefan. Stay with us, please. And uh, then, uh, good afternoon, Luis. Uh, welcome uh, to you and to uh, Microsoft uh, colleagues to join us. Uh, let me give the floor immediately, Luis, please. Bonjour, Bobin, uh, and uh, good, good day to, to all attendees. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for the kind welcome. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I'm really looking forward to share with you today um, an exciting project that Microsoft has launched. Um, it's called the Leading Countries of the World. And in fact, we've just recently rebranded it to the Leaders in Digital Transformation um, of Education. It's also known as the LTDE project. And this project brings together visionary education leaders and expert stakeholders um, in a global movement to accelerate digital transformation with insights from the technology industry. So facilitated by Microsoft, LTDE shares the, the best practices to help every nation build knowledge and, and human uh, capital for the benefits of all. So participants, participants of this program can select one or more of the, the projects, uh, one of them being EMIS. We also have a project on data and AI, computer science toolkits, and then also online professional development. So happy to share more information after my presentation. So let's jump into transforming education with EMIS, and I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to the project. So the knowledge economy is prompting education systems to improve their competitive advantage by investing in education. And at the national level, this means that policymakers are increasingly relying on the analytics of student data to inform their decision making. Education systems are realizing the importance of employing data for evidence-based education planning. And data are collected to help countries gauge the status of their education systems and identify gaps in schooling. Reporting and analytics are also used to provide trend analysis and comparisons between different regions within a country. And digital tools provide detailed and real-time information to help educators make informed decisions about student performance. Data analytics now has the power to revolutionize education by translating national level policies into classroom practice. So the collection, reporting, and the analysis of data, uh, of data seeks to help countries meet their targets outlined by the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. In simple terms, the enabler is EMIS. So the EMIS architecture underpins the way in which data are collected, stored, and reported. And the components of any software solution includes data collection, database management, and utilization. And this includes both an analytics and reporting tools. So in general, the EMIS architecture or even an information system of any organization should respond to the overall enterprise architecture. And in this case, and, in, and as part of this audience, it would be the Ministry of Education. So what is Project EMIS? So with a global focus on education management information systems, Project EMIS will support a community of leading education systems that aspire to use modern data architectures for real-time education data that is aligned to the Sustainable Development Goal 4 indicators for national and global reporting. 
So Microsoft will bring exemplary practices with, along with reputable EMIS partners that will showcase these modern architectures and support systems to develop um, essentially deployment frameworks for future adoption. Let's quickly look at a few challenges. Um, many education systems struggle with the policies, the structures and processes necessary to establish an effective EMIS. And through many engagements with various education systems, common EMIS challenges that you see on the screen here revolve around the deficiencies in three critical areas, sustainability, accountability, and efficiency. So as part of the program, we will look at these three elements um, and understand this challenge a little bit better. As part of the work to reimagine education systems, there are increasingly challenges to also develop business applications, which um, essentially supports the digi digital disruption. So complexity cre really creates dependencies, uh, which makes these systems heavy and inflexible. And with the exception of serverless, they're all relying on multiple sources and databases, which means that you essentially going to have duplicate resources, there might be some security threats due to multiple points of entry. So all of this is also making operations and management much slower and less efficient, as indicated on this slide. But the impact of accidental, accidental architecture is a topic that I think any education system can relate to. So Project EMIS is going to provide an environment where education systems can share their experiences and learn from each other to move forward in the, um, in the quest to overcome these challenges. So very quickly about the leading countries of the world in Project EMIS. Um, so in order to strengthen the capacity of educations, we're gonna, education systems, we're going to look at these three um, key indicators here. So data policy that will essentially focus on data standards, security, governance, and ethics. Um, we will be showcasing in the program different data platforms on, on modern architectures and various application softwares that, that are essentially available in the market. And finally, demonstrate research through leveraging modern data tools for data access, reporting, visualization, and data science. Quickly wanted to share with you what Microsoft sees as an, as an EMIS maturity model. Um, we've used six countries here, and they were chosen to represent the stages of EMIS. Um, the data analytics is a, is a guidance to gauge where, you, where an education system is in the EMIS maturity model. So the overview of a global education analytics has revealed essentially four stages. The first stage is, is an entry-level stage um, where nations are essentially collecting data, but using limited technology and standards. Um, and we see this as the first stage um, where data are not necessarily collected annually, nor used to inform policy. Um, the second stage is the emerging level. This is characterized by frequent and comprehensive data, but is used to create specific reporting and inform policy. So this stage includes uh, digital collection and, and storage, with, but um, however, there are no privacy policies in place. The third stage is the advanced level. This is where we see real-time data collection used to inform policy. And these education systems typically use cloud-based collection and storage technologies under national privacy provisions. And then the final stage is the fourth stage, the transformative level at which data comes from a wide range of sources, um, including telemetry and, 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 and analytics is supported by um, AI, machine learning, and cognitive services. One minute, Louise. Okay. Thank you so much. So we're really going to look at the, the what, what do we want to achieve through the program is that we want to build capacity where as an education system, we have a clear roadmap for education systems. Um, you want to make informed decisions and, about the improvement of existing EMIS and engage with vendors and, and or suppliers of EMIS on a technical basis. And for your education system to make more informed decisions and just have discussions with donor and development partners wishing to contribute to, your, to the development of your data. So I'm going to very quickly jump through these, um, <laughs> jump through these. Um, the project is aligned to the UIS and the GPE uh, that was programmed, that was mentioned, uh, guideline, sorry, that was mentioned yesterday. Um, so we can talk, a we will talk a bit, a, a lot more about that in our program. We also have a couple of, of Microsoft email solution partners that have done work across the globe. Um, so there's just some examples of them. And essentially, um, a very exciting talking point for us is 
um, is the, the Microsoft tools. We essentially have an open data, um, open source creative license. This is where we look at systems that create interoperability and, and really overcome some of the challenges that I've mentioned in my above slide. Um, these are really just a, a quick view of the Microsoft tools. Um, so that would be part of the program. And this is just going to be the, this is how Microsoft sees the, the EMIS journey. Um, I, if you are interested as an education system to participate in this program, um, I want to please um, invite you to, to reach out to me on the chat box. Um, and happy to, to share more information about the program um, that is, will be up and coming in June. So uh, very, very thankful. Well, thank you very much um, thank you, for Lewis. your time, and I look forward to engaging. Thank you, Louis. And it, it is a very busy June, I see. <laughs> Absolutely, Warren. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, dear colleagues, uh, we are running, of course, uh, uh, out of time, but still I, I would like to uh, pick up a few questions looking at the uh, the chat. Uh, maybe uh, let me first ask a question to uh, Mr. Ali Eliefi. Uh, there is a question from the chat. Are you capturing the lifelong learning paths or it is more uh, the learning paths within the schools? Uh, can you can you explain in very briefly? But we would like to hear from you, sir. Please. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Actually, we are capturing the lifelong uh, journey. So we are actually starting from prenatal, uh, where we are working together with the health and community authorities to capture data and include a portal where parents come in and they get coached and counsel how to take care of the children. And there is a material done that. So we start from prenatal going all the way to right now in the ecosystem to K-12. But now we have done a bridge between K-12 and the higher education through the banner system. So we have the banner system is like the de facto in most countries, most universities for higher education, uh, if you want to call it uh, SIS system or EMIS system. Um, so yes, the, the point is, and to continue after that, we're working on career counseling, where uh, we have the higher education working with the uh, uh, labor department um, or Ministry of Labor to, to bridge the link between what comes out what as from the higher education and goes into the job market. Have we uh, completed that journey in its tiny details? No. Have we started working on the journey? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Avi, uh, there was also another question regarding uh, data privacy and security. Again, in a nutshell, from your perspective, are those frontier technologies uh, hindering further the privacy and security of the learners and, and the data of the and, and security uh, of the learners and individuals, or uh, are they uh, improving maybe uh, the protection in a nutshell? Oh, that's a question to me, sorry. Uh... No, to Avi. Okay. I think we lost Evie. Uh, then I, I would like to give the floor to Louis. What do you think, Louis? Sorry, Boreen, I was struggling to get off mute there for a second. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was answering some of the attendees on, on the chat box. Uh, would you mind repeating that question? <laughs> no, there was a question on uh, data privacy and, and security and, and, and how uh, the MS are taking that into account. And my question was, uh, in addition to that, is uh, uh, are these frontier technologies hindering further the privacy and security of the learners, data learners, uh, or uh, are they uh, improving that? In fact, in um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's certainly improving it. And, you know, we, we have to be cognizant of all the, the, the privacy clauses in the, in, the different, um, in the different education systems in countries. Um, but what is so fantastic, and especially with, with, with modern technologies, um, you know, unique identifiers and, and essentially exporting and importing your data and making sure that you have structured and unstructured data are all tools that um, allow... Um, stakeholders to see data at a high level, but keep personal data where, where it needs to be. So um, certainly, uh, you know, from a Microsoft point of view and the tools that we have available, um, this is a key focus for us um, because we understand that this is a, a massive challenge um, and, a, and a large concern for many, many education systems. 
Excellent. Uh, Mr. Desham, there was a question also on the interoperability and, and uh, what you presented is connecting different data sets from uh, education data, vocational training, but also a uh, labor market. How, uh, again, in a nutshell, uh, how, uh, in 30 seconds, basically, how uh, your system is uh, enabling this interoperability? Okay, so it's a very um, good question and tough question because, as you know, uh, data is a very uh, sensible word. One think about data, of course, we think about the, the security of data and also privacy uh, information. So that's why I, I just mentioned with our um, uh, system and with our platform, we can integrate also third-party system and third-party uh, platform. So we we can help all our partners uh, control country or sorry region level to choose or they can pick pick up a comprehensive uh, we don't platform or they can have a com combination between our system and their system the key is a data model so you know uh, uh, we now have a very um, a strong system now to link to the data so we so we we need uh, what we what we need is um, a data warehouse and also middleware system to interconnect the data so if we define before that uh, some very precisely rules we can connect the data without problem thank you very much that's very clear stefan last question to you again a 30 second uh, response uh, of course this requires investments so uh, where the resources will come from to invest in these uh, uh, frontier technologies uh, application in management information system? What are the policy measures, the partnership that are required? Please, Stephen. Yeah, I think that uh, part of it has to come from public resources and actually factoring in the fact that it's also a source of uh, efficiency for uh, many education systems. But you're right that it also has to come from uh, partnerships, public and private partnerships uh, with also uh, with, uh, companies. And that's an important aspect to, to keep in mind. So one of the big challenge for system is how to make this and, and, and actually viable ecosystem uh, and to provide incentives to private companies and at the same time make sure that it remains affordable and sustainable for, for the public. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks to uh, all colleagues, to Avi, to Day, to Ali, uh, to Stephen and, and to Luis for uh, their contribution. I think we had a very important discussion regarding uh, what does it mean in terms of the uh, actions at, uh, at the local level, at colleges, schools, and Stephen, you shared with us that. But also we have learned how the connection between education system and labor market, what we can learn from a corporate what are the initiatives that um, corporate like Microsoft uh, is having? And what, what could be, I would say, uh, uh, an ideal model that we have heard from UAE, which is an integrated system that is, seems to be uh, functioning, tracking lifelong learning pathways and providing uh, data for decision making at different levels of education system. Thank you very much. Thanks to all uh, our speakers today, uh, Wang Shol. Back to you for the closing uh, of the day, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, indeed, it was uh, really, really interesting um, to have two sessions today. I just wonder if uh, someone can turn off. Yeah, so it was very... Uh, why? Uh, two sessions, uh, you know, trying to kind of envision the future of MEs from uh, the two uh, angles. One is more from the capacity approach perspective, more from the environment perspective, and the other one was more technology perspective. Um, so uh, it's a really uh, rich discussion that we had. And uh, I'd like to thank all the um, speakers and presenters, as well as the participants, for their participation. <clears throat> so if I may uh, uh, kind of try to uh, summarize what I, uh, I have found from the two sessions, across the two sessions, uh, it would be around uh, three or four uh, aspects. The first one is um, the future MS should be learning oriented or learning centered. Um, uh, and then we need to uh, develop uh, not only school um, 
uh, based, but uh, also learning and learner centered data systems. Um, and also, this data system should be uh, also uh, interfaced with other uh, data systems. We might need to make distinction between SIS and EMIS, uh, SIS uh, Statistical Information System versus uh, Education Management Information System. So uh, very often, many of these um, uh, data systems lack that <coughs> dimension of management, <coughs> that um, managing the learning, managing the learner, and uh, facilitating learning, and so on. This is what we have to think and the data system which are linked with our systems like uh, health, civilization, and facilitate um, the uh, family's uh, uh, participation in education as a, a school community. And someone mentioned about the interesting aspect about the marketplace. Schools should be more you know, uh, designed as a marketplace where you do have more flexibility and also a, a variety of uh, choices for the, for, from the learner's perspective. And uh, so in order to build this kind of learning center data systems, uh, I think we should think more towards uh, integrating or integrated AMIS and LMS systems. This is what uh, I hear across uh, the two sessions as the first point that I wanted uh, to share. The second part, second dimension is about uh, technology. Technologies are there to facilitate building um, you know, solid and more relevant uh, data systems in order to really support uh, not only uh, school management, but also learning management. We discuss about the AI, machine learning, predictive analysis and analytics, all these uh, aspects uh, and technology uh, solutions are there. The question is uh, how uh, now to forge the partnership around clear uh, vision, policy vision, uh, uh, regarding the future emis. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we have found from the example from different countries uh, that uh, started building a clear vision and then also clarify what kind of partnerships and uh, uh, to build in order to uh, make um, these technologies really uh, uh, av available and useful for building uh, the future kind of um, uh, emis. Uh, third aspect is about uh, uh, eco ecosystems. I think uh, many, most of uh, you say that uh, there is a, a critical uh, importance uh, of um, uh, of uh, uh, building, you know, uh, ecosystems. Technology is important, but it's not a, a recipe for everything, and uh, it's a, it has to do also the uh, uh, change in mindset and building data culture and also building kind of uh, clarifying the governance and uh, building frameworks uh, that clarifies not only the use of data, partnership, intersectoriality, as well as uh, data privacy and protection. Uh, and then also, the, um, uh, you know, uh, we, the, the, there is need also uh, for sustainable funding uh, for uh, EMIS and also uh, leveraging, strengthening the local e ecosystems, uh, bringing in also uh, you know, universities, research uh, institutions from the country in order to participate in the building of the uh, future uh, lo in, uh, you know, ecosystems for more um, uh, you know, solid, um, uh, 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 solid emits while clarifying the roles and responsibilities of each and also uh, doing away with fragmentation and uh, strengthening the synergy and as well as uh, the interoperability across uh, different data systems. Lastly, uh, it is uh, about user-oriented uh, data systems because uh, uh, very often uh, technology are there and it's very complicated and complex and so on, but uh, really if uh, you know, that, uh, what you do uh, is not uh, taking into uh, account the, the ultimate users of the data, is uh, then uh, the uh, usefulness and the relevance of the, the data systems will be um, uh, mixed and mitigated, uh, uh, weakened. So it has to do also when even uh, the top up approach is important, but also there is also kind of a mix of a top down and bottom up approach in building and uh, su sustaining the data systems and uh, ha having to do also to adapt to the local context and uh, strengthen the relevance of data systems to uh, really um, uh, the, 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 what, uh, the, uh, the expectation of the uh, community and also uh, you know, uh, uh, to make sure that, um, uh, that uh, data systems um, 
uh, really used, uh, in, uh, including also the, the necessary measures uh, for the strength of visualization and other aspects that um, you know, uh, uh, is required. Also, the, some people said about the burden uh, on teachers, uh, how uh, uh, to make sure that uh, there is not an add-on, it's part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the data management. And uh, also the, uh, you know, in order to make a, to tackle this demand driven approach, uh, there is also important aspects of, uh, you know, capacity development of, of the users. So these are the four areas that I, I found uh, across the two sessions. Um, and uh, it does not mean that uh, uh, this uh, uh, of four aspects is uh, exclusive. Uh, I think we are going to uh, continue this discussion tomorrow uh, at the same time. Uh, tomorrow discussion, tomorrow meeting uh, session will be more interactive and um, a stimulating discussion about what we can do now to collaborate and uh, uh, and uh, as a uh, as a global part uh, partners uh, in the form of the, uh, the international community of practice and clarifying different aspects that we have discussed. So I would like to uh, welcome you back tomorrow once again at the same time for more interactive discussion for the future of EMIS, uh, and thank you very much. Bye. Recording stopped.